In this example, I want to demonstrate uh, the previous theorem, right? I mean, we've already proven the theorem, so it's not that we necessarily need it, but let's look at some concrete uh, matrices. Uh, well, I should say a, comp a concrete symmetric matrix to kind of uh, show you exactly what the previous theorem was telling us about the orthogonality of eigenvectors for a symmetric matrix. So you can see this 3x3 three three matrix up here. Um, a, which is symmetric, of course, uh, you'll see that as you swap positions on the diagonal, uh, you get the exact same matrix again. And it can be shown that the eigenvalues of this matrix A are 8, 6, and 3. Um, there's a calculation involved there. You'd have to compute the characteristic polynomial and factor and such, but that can be done. Um, and you can also check that with each of these eigenvalues, you can find their corresponding eigenvectors will be negative 1, 1, 0, negative 1, negative 1, 2, and 1, 1, 1. So again, we're not going to go through the details of this, but uh, you know, one could go through the whole enchilada and find uh, these eigenvectors and eigenvalues. What I want to proceed to do is show you that these eigenvectors are in fact orthogonal with each other. So if we take the first eigenvector v1 and dot it with v2 right here, uh, the, the, the dot product would give us a 1 minus 1 plus 0, which is equal to 0. So we see that v1 is orthogonal to v2, as to be expected. Uh, next, we take v1 dot v2. Uh, in that situation, you'll end up with negative 1 plus 1 plus 0. So that's, again, also 0. And thus showing us that v1... Oh, I said v2 there. I meant v3, sorry. Uh, v1 dot v3, that's equal to 0. So we get that v1 is orthogonal to v3, like so. And then finally, if we take v2 dot v3, make sure you get it right this time, dude, uh, you'll end up with negative 1 minus 1 plus 2, that's equal to 0, thus showing us that v2 is orthogonal to v3. All right, so we can see that these eigenvectors are in fact orthogonal with each other. And you can verify that these are in fact orthogonal, or the, the, these vectors are in fact eigenvectors uh, for this matrix. For example, if you take A times the vector 1, 1, 1, um, you can see very quickly that for the first entry, you get 6 minus 2 minus 1. You're going to get negative 2 plus 6 minus 1. And then finally, you get negative 1 minus 1 plus 5. And in all instances, those add up to be 3. Right. These are these are in fact the real McCoy here, uh, the all of the eigenvectors and such. But what I want to do is carry this problem just a little bit further, sort of show uh, showcasing what's going to be coming up in just a second. Um, because we have these eigenvectors and eigenvalues, we can actually very quickly construct an ortho. Uh, excuse me, construct a diagonalization for the matrix A here. Right. So we've seen in the previously that a diagonalization can happen when we find a non-singular matrix P a diagonal of matrix D and the inverse of P like this. It's a factorization where D is a diagonal matrix. And in this diagonalization, we're gonna get these three three by three matrices like so. And the diagonal matrix is just gonna coincide with the, the eigenvalues of the, of the matrix here. So we have eight, so we get eight in the diagonal we're going to get six as our second one. So we get six in the diagonal there. And then our last one is a three. So we're gonna get a three right here. Uh, we'll get zeros everywhere else because it is a diagonal matrix after all. Then we will put in the eigenvectors right here. We put those into the matrix P, but before we do that, we do want this, uh, I mean, we can get, we can get away with uh, with like this, negative one, one, zero, that's perfectly fine. Uh, we, we can stick then the second one in right here, put it in there, in which case then we get negative one, negative one, and two. And then finally, if we stick in the third matrix right here, that would go into the third column, we get one, one, one. So we can construct our matrix P by using the eigenbasis that's in front of us. And we'll, then we'll compute P inverse right over here. But I want to make one slight modification to this. Uh, a modification that will make much more sense in just a second. So we can, I want to, because after all, with when it comes to the matrix P, I just need to have an eigenbasis. It doesn't have to be the exact three I have in front of us. Uh, what we can do is I'm going to make the substitution that instead of using V1, I'm going to use the vector U1, which is equal to 
1 over the square root of 2 times negative 1, 1, 0, like this. So we get negative 1 over root 2, we get 1 over root 2, and we get 0. Basically, I just took the normalization of our, of our vector there, the normalization. I computed its length and divided it out. Uh, and similarly, I'm going to do this for u2, which notice that the length of this vector is going to be the square root of 6. So you get 1 over the square root of 6 times negative 1, negative 1, 2. And so let's see. I don't know if I can squeeze that all in there. So let me give myself a little bit more space. So remember, u1 was negative 1 over the square root of 2. We get 1 over the square root of 2 and 0. So for u2, we're going to get negative 1 over the square root of 6. We're going to get, again, another negative 1 over the square root of 6, and we get 2 over the square root of 6. And then lastly, for, for u3, uh, I want you to notice that the length of v3 is equal to the square root of 3. And so the vector we're going to squeeze in here is 1 over the square root of 3. 1 over the square root of 3, and 1 over the square root of 3. So the, why, did I, why did I go about orthogonal or normalizing these three vectors right here to put inside a P? Well, the issue is that since these vectors, v1, v2, v3, are already orthogonal to each other, if I normalize, that makes this eigenbasis an orthonormal basis. And if you have a matrix whose columns form an orthonormal basis, that's what we called before an orthogonal matrix making connections what we saw before. And orthogonal matrices have the property that their inverse is none other than just its transpose. So P inverse is just P transpose. And so I don't have to go through this inversion algorithm to calculate P inverse. I can just take the transpose of this thing um, if it's an orthogonal matrix. So taking the transpose, you get one, negative one over the square root of two, uh, one over the square root of two, and we'll just, we're just going to clear this out for a second. And then we get a zero right here. That's our first. So our first column becomes our first row. Uh, then we get negative one over the square root of six, negative one over the square root of six, and two over the square root of six. And then lastly, we end up with one over the square root of three. And this happens three times. And so we can very easily calculate the inverse by taking uh, by taking the transpose instead of the usual inversion algorithm. So there's sort of a s simplicity. That is, I could just normalize the vectors uh, in this eigenbasis, which is fairly easy in terms of computation, right? Um, and then if I'm willing to normalize them, then I essentially have to put no effort into finding the transpose. So there's a little bit of a trade-off there. And so we get this diagonalization, a diagonalization that uses uh, an orthogonal matrix right here. And so this right here is actually uh, the idea we're leading up to. Uh, and we'll see this in the next video in just a second. Click it so you can watch it.